Mark chapter 6. Let me read verses 7 through 13. Mark chapter 6, 7 through 13. The Word of God says, And he, Jesus, summoned the twelve, and began to send them out in pairs, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey, except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money for their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out of there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you, as we hear from your word, pray that you guide my words. Help us to understand what you're saying so that we may go out and live it. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we focused on verse 7. We talked about this being kind of the orientation period of the 12 apostles, those whom Jesus summoned to salvation, summoned to himself to be with him in order so that that he could send them out. We looked specifically at verse 7 as he, again, summoned the 12 to himself. We saw that in John 1 where some of them came to know the Lord We saw him specifically summon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and Matthew in Mark 1 and 2, and then he finished out the 12 in Mark 3. And we looked at that all in detail a few months back. So after summoning him again here, he began to send them out. He also supplied them with the authority to cast out demons and to heal diseases. And that was merely to validate the message that they were preaching. This was their first mission trip, really a short-term mission trip that Jesus was sending them out. And he sent them out two by two. We looked at that again last week. And he did that so that they can encourage each other, so they can spur each other, protect each other, and again, bear witness of each other. But today we'll continue working through this section, and I'm pretty confident that we will finish it today, okay? So we'll look specifically at verses 8 through 13. Mark 6, 8 through 13. And Mark gives us four aspects as Jesus summoned, sent, and supplied these 12 men for their mission, teaching them valuable lessons for what they will deal with later on within their own ministry. So four aspects, teaching them valuable lessons, teaching these 12 men valuable lessons on what they will deal with later on in their ministry. And that first aspect is in verse 8 and 9. It's my first point. Jesus instructs these men to be dependent. Jesus instructs them to be dependent. To be dependent. So look at with me in verses 8 and 9 in Mark 6. It says, And Jesus instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey, except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. So again, after Jesus summons them, but before he sends them out and gives them the work to do, he he gives them some instructions, some basic instructions. And these instructions fall into two parts, with the first set of instructions detailing what they should take on their journey. Jesus instructs them here in Mark to take a staff, to wear a pair of sandals, and to only take one tunic. He tells them not to take any food with them, not to take a bag or any money. Jesus is basically telling them, travel light. These instructions really kind of refer back to what God instructed the Israelites to do upon their uh, exodus from Egypt. You can look at that in Exodus 12, but but they were commanded to be ready at any moment, to leave their home at any moment. 
God commanded them at that time to eat the Passover meal. We see in Exodus 12, 11 that it says, Now, I want you to eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and the staff in your hand. They were to be dressed. They were to be ready to leave quickly and to travel light. So Jesus gives his 12 apostles the same instructions here. Have a staff in your hand, wear a pair of sandals on your feet, and have one tunic. Pretty simple instructions, right? But what about the other synoptics, Matthew and Luke? This is one section in Scripture where skeptics like to discredit the Bible. They like to say, well, the Bible has errors because Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of contradict themselves here. In our text, Mark says Jesus was telling them to take a staff, to take sandals. But Luke says, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money. Don't take two tunics. Matthew, on the other hand, in Matthew 10, 9 and 10, says this, Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts, or a bag for your journey, or even two coats, or sandals, or a staff. I mean, these passages seem to be uh, contradicting each other, don't they? So is the Bible invalid? Are there discrepancies within the scriptures? I mean, how do we deal with the tension here? And I think there's a solution. Again, we hold to a grammatical hermeneutic here. So when Matthew specifically says, don't acquire a bag or, or even two coats or sandals or a staff, I think more than likely he means this. Do not take along anything extra. You have sandals on your feet, but don't take an extra pair of sandals or an extra staff. Because you see here in Matthew 10 and 9 and 10, he says, referencing the sandals and the staff, they immediately follow his instructions not to take two coats. Therefore, the warning against taking anything extra, such as a tunic, carries over to the next item. Do not take two tunics, do not take two sandals, and do not take two staffs. So we can validate that back in Mark when we see him saying, Jesus says, don't take food, money, or anything to buy food with or a bag, but take a staff. Take what you have in your hand. Only take the sandals of your feet. But then he tells them, do not take two tunics. The staff in your hand must be the only staff you take along. The sandals on your feet are the only sandals you must wear. And the tunic, the coat that you have on, must be the only one that you take. And by doing this, I believe Jesus is teaching these 12 men to be dependent on God as he will supply their needs. The message Jesus says is very clear here. In all three gospel accounts, the main objective of what Jesus is saying is travel light. Be ready. Don't focus merely on the materialistic things for your journey. Be dependent on the Lord. He'll supply your needs. So don't take anything extra. Don't take an extra coat. Don't take an extra tunic. Don't take extra sandals or an extra staff. Don't even take food or money to buy food or a bag. And I think it's important to mention this bag, really, the word used here could be portrayed as a beggar's bag. And if that's the case, these beggar bags are, are, were used to collect money. Itinerant preachers would go from city to city with these beggar bags as, as their equipment, part of their equipment. And they would go around after they preached and they would collect a, a, a little bit, for, for the, not, not only for themselves, but to take back to the one who sent them out to preach. So Jesus was forbidding them to beg for money. Again, they were going to have needs. But they were going to be forced to be entirely dependent on the Lord to meet and provide for every one of those needs. And I don't want you to misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. 
Because he's not saying, hey, in order to go into ministry, you have to sell everything and then just let go and let God. He's not saying that. He's not saying, hey, you need to take a permanent vow of poverty. You need to be poor. He's not saying that. I think people misunderstand that at times, especially those who go into ministry. I remember when I was back in Minnesota, there was a, a man who was going through, uh, he, wanted, he was going through Bible school in, at a Lutheran uh, university, and he was married and he just had a baby. And I remember uh, me and a buddy talking about him. He like left his whole family, sold everything, and misunderstood this as, hey, if I'm going to go into ministry, I have to sell everything, give it to the poor, and then just go out. Like, he was living out of his car. He left his wife, left his kid. I mean, he was doing everything contrary to what the Bible says we are to do. That's not what Jesus means here. Paul actually states in 1 Timothy 5.8, if anyone does not provide for his family, especially those in his own household, he has denied the faith, and he's no better than an unbeliever. And if Jesus was really telling them to take a permanent vow of poverty, why would we see Jesus later tell the disciples the opposite thing in Luke before he was going to die, and before they were really going to be sent out on their mission? Luke 22, 35 through 37, Jesus says this to them, When I sent you out, speaking of this time, when I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals, did you not lack anything? And they said, no, we we lack nothing. And he said to them, but now, whoever has money, money belt is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you the truth. This which is written must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with transgressors. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. Again, Jesus was going to die. He was saying, okay, now you've learned to be dependent on the Lord to meet your needs. Now, now is the time to be prepared. Be ready. Take those things with you. What Jesus was doing here again was instructing these 12 men of the importance of relying and trusting in God's faithfulness, as well as seeing him provide for their needs at this particular time. You know, on this mission, he's saying, I want you to be dependent on God. I mean, that's what he taught in in the Sermon on the Mount, was it not? Matthew 5, 31, or Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Do not worry then saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows what you need and that you need all these things. But what does he say? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Then everything else will be added unto you. I mean, we can find comfort in that. Knowing that God will supply all our needs. Set aside the materialistic things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then God will provide. God continually supplies the needs when we need them. I mean, going through seminary, I saw this all the time. I mean, there was a reason God put the seminary I went to in California, because it was hard to live there. It's very expensive. But God always provided for our needs. There were many people in, in more dire situations than Katie and myself, and uh, there, were, uh, there was a time when a buddy of mine was like, hey, I might have to drop out. I can't, I can't pay for tuition. I just don't have the money. And then all of a sudden, a couple of days before, money would appear. You just pray and trust in God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Everything else will be added unto you. God is doing that over and over in our lives, even today. Even today, providing for all our needs as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Again, this isn't let go and let God mentality. This is seek first his kingdom and his righteousness mentality. Be fully dependent on the Lord. Again, to be prepared. Don't live in poverty purposefully. But again, don't put the materialistic things in the forefront. Put God first, and then everything else will fall into place. So again, we see Jesus first instructing his 12 disciples to be dependent on God. But next, we see him instructing them regarding contentment. We see that in verse 10. That's my second point. 
Jesus instructs them on contentment. Look with me in Mark 6, verse 10. And he said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. So just as Jesus instructs these men that they should, what they should and should not take on their journey, the second set of instructions is regard as to how they will act when they enter a city. They are to be grateful guests by staying put where they are received. Again, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Obviously, traveling was very different than what we do now. I mean, we would be driving on a road, we get tired, we pull off, stay in a hotel, right? Well, they're not going to pull off their beaten paths and, and stay in some inn. Inns in those times were really dirty, were really dangerous at times. So travelers really would often sleep outdoors, hence why they would take two tunics. So they would wear one and then use the other as a covering. But Jesus was saying to the apostles, hey, you, you don't need to worry about staying outside. You'll be staying inside. Be dependent on the Lord, right? But what usually happened when a traveler would enter a city, as preachers, itinerant preachers entered a city, they would stay in people's homes. People would invite them to stay into their home. And how that is decided, really, Matthew makes that a little more clear in his gospel. If you want to turn back to Matthew 10, you can see that. Matthew 10, verse 11, Matthew says this, And whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his house until you leave that city. So it was the duty of the townspeople, specifically those who were worthy, probably those who accepted the message, to extend hospitality and invite them to stay at their home. And Jesus instructs them to, to, to enter this, this house, and when you enter that house, don't leave it until you leave town. I mean, why would Jesus say this? What's the point of, of them staying put in this house? And I think it's very important. One commentator states this regarding the importance of this statement. He says, the natural human tendency for travelers would be to move up the social ladder, accepting better and better accommodations, whether from wealthier people. Such favoritism is not only sinful, but could produce jealousy and disunity among the brethren. For the apostles themselves, it would foster a culture of greed and a lack of dependence on God, running counter to the very reason for accepting the hospitality of others. It would contradict what they were preaching. Jesus was saying, you're not to move from house to house. You're to graciously, graciously accept the invitation of this initial worthy person and decline all other upgrades. And when we fly, we're, we're, we're hoping to get first-class upgrades. When we go to hotels, man, I hope I get the sweet upgrade, right? Usually never happens, but you always hope. But Jesus is telling them, don't do that. Basically, find contentment where you are. I'm giving you the authority to preach. I'm giving you the authority to heal and cast out demons. You've seen the popularity that, that has come to me due to these works and these miraculous wonders that I do. It's going to be the same for you. You're not doing this in order to become some social somebody. So deny all the invitations of upgrades, regardless of the comfort. The spread of the gospel has a priority over personal likes and dislikes. You must remain in the home of the person who is kind enough to extend hospitality to you. And that's what Jesus is instructing them to do. The verb he used for, or Mark used for stay, is an imperative. It's a command. It's in the present tense. It's, it's carrying the idea of a continuous staying. He's like, you must continually stay there. I command you to do this. When you enter the house, no matter what the condition, no matter what the comfort level that you may expect, you must continually stay at this place until you leave that town. And really, it distinguished them from the false teachers that would enter the city. 
I mean, they made a career of going from house to house, upgrading, seeking more money, taking advantage of the resources that were extended to them. They were never content with what they had. They always wanted more and to be something more. Paul warns of these people in his letter to Timothy. He instructed Timothy to have a character of contentment. Don't be like the false teachers. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 11 states this, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering... With these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So he says, Timothy, but flee from these things. You man of God, pursue righteousness, right? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Don't pursue money. It's an idol. But pursue righteousness and holiness. Again, Jesus was instructing these men with with the same concept that Paul instructed Timothy. Your ministry is not for personal gain. Therefore, if a poor person offers you into his home, stay there and stay there with with gladness. And once you enter that home, don't you dare leave. Not even if a wealthy man comes and says, hey, you have some great gifts. Let's upgrade. Be a little more comfortable. You don't leave. To do that, it's no better to than a false teacher. Sadly, we see this all the time, specifically in ministry. We see false teachers upgrading all the time. You know, one illustration I heard of a a pastor, he he, uh, was from Europe here in America preaching, and uh, his church gave him a month, him him and his family, a month to go back to Europe and to kind of this this, uh, break. And he went back, and, and a friend of his gave him a car to, to drive while he was there for the month. And about a week in, a week in to the trip, he met another friend and had a bigger car, more comfortable, more durable. And he said to his ever-dying shame, he called his friend and said, Hey, I don't need your car anymore because I have something else that was provided for me. And then you read passages like that, and you're like, man, this guy willingly gave his car up. I should have just, and and then I upgraded because I wanted to be more comfortable. And he had to ask his friend for forgiveness because he felt like he sinned against them. We shouldn't do that. I'm not saying upgrades and stuff aren't bad, but again, when we're doing ministry work, when we're doing things for the glory of God, we, we, we need to... Accept the things that are given to us and not look for upgrades. I mean, isn't that what Jesus says on the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 5, 37? Let what you say be simple. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this comes from evil. It's greed, selfishness. Right? Hebrews 13, 5 states, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Right? Seek first his kingdom. See how scripture just connects each other? Scripture interprets scripture. The analogy of faith. That's why we take the whole counsel of God here. God will never leave us nor forsake us. We need to be dependent on him to supply all our needs. Be prepared. Be be ready to go. But again, be content with what we have as well. Just as the apostles were dependent on the Lord as they went on this trip, they were to be content. We must practice that in our lives as well. Next, Jesus not only instructs them, but then he warns them. He gives them a warning about those who may be defiant against them. We see that in verse 11. Jesus 
warns them of those who may be defiant. Mark 6, verse 11. He says, any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. So again, after Jesus gives them instructions, he moves on and tells them how they should respond to those who are defiant against them. Jesus warned, if you enter a city and you're preaching the message that I'm sending you to preach, you're verifying this message to be true through this miraculous authority that I gave you, and if they don't receive you or even listen to you, leave. Leave the city. And when you leave, I want you to literally shake the dust off the soles of your feet as a testimony against them. And this shaking the dust off your feet comes from a tradition that, was, that Jews did when they left a Gentile community. They were required to shake the dust off their feet so they wouldn't contaminate or, or bring any uncleanness back from their pagan practices back into Israel. But again, the fact of of doing this really demonstrates and symbolizes God's judgment on rejecting the message. Really, God's judgment on rejecting the message. And Matthew demonstrates this again more clearly in his account when he records Jesus' words this way. Matthew chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. He says this, Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out from that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. He goes on, truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Whew. Those who have been exposed to the truth of salvation, those who, who reject what they have heard and what they have seen, Those who will not receive the gospel will receive the severest form of eternal punishment. We've seen this actually done in in the book of Acts when Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey. We see in Acts 13, 50, and 51, the Jews incited devout women and, and the leaders of the city, and they instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas. They were creating this uproar, saying, hey, we don't accept these men. These men are teaching falsely. And they drove them out of the city. And before they left, what did Paul and Barnabas do? They shook the dust off their feet as a protest against them. So what Jesus is explaining here, those who reject the gospel, which again is the offer of, for the forgiveness of sins, the offer of eternal life, they will suffer severe punishment. I mean, that's pretty intense. It should cause those who reject the gospel to to stand in fear, shake in fear. I mean, all the time, I mean, don't you wonder, why would people reject this free gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of sin? Why would anybody reject that? But they do. They love their sin more than they love righteousness. I mean, my mind goes to, there's a friend, that Katie and I, is in our wedding, actually. Grew up in a Christian home. Married for 20 years. Pretended for a very long time. Confessed faith as a young, as a young person. Gave it up. Left her family with another person. Doesn't want to have anything to do with Christianity. Disowned her family. Unless you accept me for who I am and what I'm doing, I won't have anything to do with you. Slanders the church. I mean, you think of those verses. Do you shake the dust off their feet? Do you not cast pearls before swine? You totally reject the message of the gospel. I think of the verses in Hebrews. You're trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. Man, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Think of Moses in the Hall of Faith, right? He could have, he could have basked in the pleasures of sin. He, he, he could have been a prince of Egypt, but he, but he sacrificed it. 
He, he set aside the pleasures of sin for a season. Why? Because of his faith to be with his people, to lead his people. Think of 2 Peter 2.21. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, then turn away from the holy command and commandment handed to them. And I think of our friend. Man, she turned away. Sacrifice eternal life for the pleasures of sin for a season. What foolishness. What foolishness. But that's what Jesus is saying. And my heart aches for people who reject the gospel. I mean, I, usually we, we, we think of the people who do it angrily, like our friend. Reject it angrily. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Pretended for all her life, pretended. And yet, we see who she truly is. But also, those, there's people who reject it superficially. There are many in our churches today sitting, maybe right here, sitting right here, who continually come, continually hear the gospel, but yet walk away, walk out the doors unregenerated. Again, speaking of this, J.C. Ryle gives great application when he says this. He says, quote, this is a truth which we find very frequently laid down in the Gospels. It is painful to think how entirely it is overlooked by so many. Thousands appear to suppose that so long as they go to church, so long as they've never murdered anyone or steal or cheat or openly break any of God's commandments, they're doing no great danger. They forget that it needs something more than mere abstinence from outward irregularities to save a person's soul. They do not see one of the greatest sins a man can commit in the sight of God is to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and not believe it. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's what Jesus says. To be invited or to be compelled to repent and believe in the gospel and yet remain careless and unbelieving. In short, to reject the gospel will sink a person to the lowest place in hell. Let us never turn away from a passage like this without asking ourselves, what are we doing with the gospel? We supposedly live in a Christian land. We have many Bibles within our houses. We hear the salvation of the gospel frequently every single Sunday. But yet, do we receive it into our hearts? Have we really obeyed it in our lives? Have we, in short, laid hold of the hope set before us, taken up the cross, denied ourselves, and follow Jesus? If not, we are far worse than a heathen who bow down to stocks and stones. We are far more guilty than those of Sodom and Gomorrah who never heard the gospel and therefore never rejected it. But as for us, we hear the gospel and yet we will not believe. May we all search our own hearts and take heed that we do not ruin our own souls by rejecting it. End quote. And if that's you this morning, if you continually hear the gospel and you walk out those doors saying, you know what, I'm okay. I'm okay. I can do it on my own. I plead with you. I beg you. Don't leave today until you know without a shadow of doubt if you died today, you will go to heaven. Not on anything that you have done, but on the basis of Christ alone, what he did. He lived the perfect life. He died the perfect death. Three days later, he satisfied the wrath of God, and it shows because he was raised from the dead. I heard someone uh, on this little clip today, we don't go to the cross to die. No, we go to the resurrection because through his death, we are made alive because he rose again from the dead. If you continue to reject this message, you're far more guilty than those of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read about that, what they did in Genesis 19. And they were destroyed with fire and brimstone. So I plead with you, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus today. Today's the day of salvation. 
So again, Jesus instructs his 12 apostles to be fully dependent on the Lord through, their, through this mission, to be content to stay and not, not do this for their own personal gain. He warned them of those who may be defiant against them. But next, we're shown that as they, as they demonstrate these things, as they go out, they're obedient to these instructions. Point number four, verse 12 and 13. We're shown they were obedient. They were obedient. They went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Again, they responded in obedience. That's what Christians do. They respond in obedience. They went out literally means they moved out or away from that area. They, they left Jesus and, and spread throughout the region preaching. They went out to preach, and that's exactly what they did. They preached what Christ himself continually preached, that men should repent, turn from sin, and believe in the gospel. And I like that Mark puts the preaching first here. Because preaching the gospel is always primary to everything else. It's primary to everything else. We read in Romans 10 that they come to faith by hearing, right? And hearing by the word of Christ. How do they hear? Well, they're, they hear by a preacher being sent. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. They bring the gospel. And I said this last week. I, again, I'm not sure who quoted this. But, again, I think it's garbage. I, I think this is a bad quote. Preach the gospel at all times, but with, when necessary, use words. I think that's totally contrary to the Bible. It's not biblical. That's not what Jesus did. It's not what these apostles did. It's not what the apostle Paul did. No, they proclaimed the gospel. The word used here for preached actually means this, to announce, to make known, to proclaim loudly, to tell others. That's what they did. They used words, not when necessary, but all the time. They preached, they proclaimed the gospel loudly that men should repent. And they validated the message as true by the gift of the authority given to them by Jesus to cast out demons and to heal diseases. Again, they were merely an extension of Jesus' ministry. Their mission was the same as Jesus's. Go out into the communities, tell those that they are sinners before a holy God and they need to repent. They proclaimed the works of Jesus or they did the works of Jesus by proclaiming the words of Jesus. Exactly what Jesus did in his ministry. So in both their words and actions, they did exactly what Jesus did. And they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They were obedient to their task. And again, these men were not special. They were just ordinary men. They were with Jesus, summoned to be with him. They heard him preach and teach. They learned from him. And he summoned them, sent them, and supplied them with the authority to continue his mission. Again, these ordinary and untrained men merely represented their teacher. And later on, people began to realize this. Again, they were nothing special. Acts 4.13, what's it say? Now, as they observed the confidence of these men and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to realize what? That they had some special power? No. They begin to realize that these men were with Jesus. They represented Jesus. And we can find encouragement in that. Because Jesus uses flawed individuals to accomplish his purpose. We're reminded of that in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. For consider your calling. Listen to this. Consider your calling. That not were many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many mobile or noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world and the despised things God has chosen and the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. Again, if you think you're wise, if you think you're strong, you need to revamp your thinking because you're glorying in yourself. 
You're boasting in yourself and not in the Lord. He uses the weak and he uses the foolish to shame the wise. He has to. He has to. Why? So that no man may boast before God. To him who boasts, boast in the Lord. These men would become Christ's instruments. The men used to turn the world upside down. We're evidence of it. Again, we went through church history. We're almost done with it. Kind of sad. Because, I mean, it's just so encouraging. For 2,000 years, we see this, this pattern of Christ building his church, using weakened vessels, earthen vessels. We, we uh, read that in 2 Corinthians, uh, what was it, 4 today. We're weakened vessels. We find encouragement in that because God uses us. The church is far from perfect. Grace Community Bible Church is not a perfect church. I'm sorry to, to uh, inform you of that. But we carry the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. How do we teach them? We go to the scriptures. That's why we have the scriptures. We're the body of Christ. We're his hands and his feet in this world. We're jars of clay. We're merely earthen vessels, aren't we? Who have been filled, as 2 Corinthians 4, 7, to show that all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So again, our task is simple. It's much like the, the, the apostles. We're to proclaim the message of salvation to this lost and dying world, just like they did. And what's that message? God takes sinners. We're all sinners. God takes sinners and transforms them into saints. He rescues us from the domain of darkness and brings us to the kingdom of his beloved son. It's all for him. That's the gospel. That's why we come and we worship Christ because he provided it for us. That's the gospel I preach and I will always preach that gospel. You will never hear another gospel as long as I live come out of my mouth. It's the greatest thing to come out of my mouth, about any mouth. It's the greatest thing to fall on anybody's ears. The gospel, that God takes sinners and transforms them into saints. Children of God were adopted into God's family. It should cause us to shout it from the mountaintops. Are we dependent on the Lord? Are we content in our circumstances? We, we know people are going to be defiant against us. But guess what? We continually be obedient. We continually obey. Preach the gospel. That's what we must do. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the gospel. Thank you for this text showing us your plan of salvation and, and the means of salvation. You knew you were going to go die and be raised again and, and be taken up to heaven and you were going to leave these men these 12 individuals, to be the foundation of the church. And we can build on that foundation. We can build on it right here in Dyersburg, Tennessee, in this area. And I pray, Lord, that we will do it. Preach the gospel. Die and then be forgotten because you deserve all the glory. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.